Good evening, everyone. Good evening. And thank you for coming out on this lovely rainy evening um, to uh, talk about the upcoming proposal for expansion to the library. Uh, it has been a long journey to get us to where we are today. Um, a journey that a lot of people may not know, um, but actually started um, over 10 years ago. When I became the director here in 2007, um, I met with my predecessor, then Judy Devilstein, and one of the first things that she shared with me is that there were growing concerns about uh, the Youth Services Department and that there were also future plans to expand um, and that perhaps one day uh, in the future we would need to reconsider that and look at those plans. Um, fast forward several years from 2007 to 2011, I had my first strategic plan with the Oxford Public Library Board and the staff and members of the community. We brought a number of people together, uh, not just staff of the library, not just the board, but people in the community as well, community leaders and other members of, of the community that use and uh, also some who were not frequent visitors of our library. And that group uh, met with um, Hartzell Micah Consulting, our consultants back then, uh, and also we brought in the CEO of Howard County, Maryland Library, um, to discuss some of the concepts that they were taking on uh, at their library system that we uh, had interest in possibly implementing here. So we looked at a number of things. You can see um, we developed at that point in time the vision statement, Transforming Tomorrow, Preserving Our Past and Enriching Lives Today. We also built our mission statement out of that meeting. Uh, we put together a number, as many strategic planning sessions go, you create a number of goals and objectives, uh, and then they are left to execute after those are adopted by the board. That process took place. The board adopted the 2011-2015 strategic plan, and the staff and I, along with the board and members of the community, were tasked with the uh, responsibility of trying to execute the goals and objectives. One of the main things that you can see uh, on the upper right-hand corner of this page uh, is that there was a goal to assure the facility meets the needs of the community. And one of the first objectives was to expand the children's area to accommodate collection growth and to encourage better parent-child interaction. We were also looking for options to explore a better curb appeal for the library um, and to consider options for outdoor seating. Uh, upon that, uh, they were forward in their thought process at that time uh, and also liked us, or asked us rather, to consider whenever we did go for a plan to consider green alternatives. And so we have, um, through the preliminary, preliminary discussion of this plan, we've discussed many different options, none of which have been formalized yet, but we, do, we have been looking at all of the options to consider as we move forward. The 2011-2015 plan uh, moved forward and was executed. Now there were a lot of things that we were able to accomplish during that time period and there were others that didn't quite get accomplished. And so we fast forward to plan 2020. In 2015-2016, um, we started looking at uh, what, what we had accomplished in the 2011-2015 the plan, what we needed to still work toward um, obtaining, uh, and you know, the whole time the board was discussing uh, the, the possibility, and I had had many dialogues back and forth with our architect, Mr. Penchensky, uh, Seth Penchensky, uh, is here from Daniels and Sir Mack. He is a principal with the firm. Uh, and the nice thing too, uh, before I go any further, is to just let you know that uh, Mr. Penchensky has great familiarity with our community. Um, he's familiar with this building. 
Uh, he was a senior architect under David Milling and Associates when they designed this building in 96, 97. Well, okay. probably you started designing okay. before then, but when you built Sorry, it, 95. 97. Um, and so he, he understands the logistics of this, the layout and the infrastructure of the existing building. Uh, and he also worked with us in 2005, was it? Area. In 2005, when we expanded in, um, expanded the teen area and renovated to make that to what it is today. Uh, he worked with us on that plan as well. And there was actually a very small renovation of the youth area even before 2005 um, when the building was only a few years old to because it was pretty quickly determined that it was growing too quickly and needed more space. So there were some quiet study rooms or there's some kind of tutoring rooms that were actually eliminated to open up more space for the collection. In the children's room? Yeah. That's correct. If you're familiar with our children's room, if you walk into the main entrance and you look off to the left corner, you'll see um, beams that come out from the ceiling. And those structural beams were originally a wall um, that had quiet study rooms. I think an office space was there. Uh, and when they realized they needed to um, make the room bigger then, uh, they were able to vacate those offices and rooms to expand the existing footprint without changing the envelope of the building itself, uh, along with the expansion of the teen area when Parks and Recreation moved out of our facility to their own facility. And so it's been an ongoing process. Um, and in 2000, um, 2016, when we put together the plan 2020, uh, the board um, early on had made the conscientious decision that we really weren't wanting to entertain going to the voters to ask to expand the facility when we were still paying for the existing building. And that was very important to them that we get the bond debt for the existing building paid off before we consider going to the voters for an approval to expand the facility anymore. So in 2016, the building was, was paid off. Um, and that, that bond debt came off the tax roll. <coughs> Uh, and so, in looking at the plan 2020, I'm going to fast forward. Um, one of the one of the points was again to assure the facility meets the needs of Oxford both today and beyond 2020. And you can see that by means of marketing and town hall meetings, actively engaging the community at large, and support for a capital campaign to accommodate an expansion of the youth services department. So at that point in time, they felt comfortable knowing that the building was paid off um, and, and we were uh, willing to start the process because it's a very lengthy process uh, that we go through to design and implement uh, any expansion to, to the building. Um, and that brought us to pre-pandemic. Uh, and we were looking at bringing this proposal to the voters um, going through informational meetings like we were anticipating, like we're doing this evening, um, and then the whole world shut down. And we were finding ourselves working from home and in a totally different environment than any of us were accustomed to or even in some ways prepared for. Uh, and the board at the time made the conscientious decision to forego any wide scale marketing of the proposal because none of us knew what the future was going to bring at that time. And none of us really felt comfortable with our environment. And we felt it was necessary to just let it go and we'll deal with the consequences that may come later. But we felt that that was the, the best decision for us to make. Now, we fast forward and we are looking at a bond in November. And the rationale, because we've we have honestly taken some heat. Why are you bringing this back to the voters when we've already said we are not wanting to support it? And we felt that given the fact that we didn't really have a fair opportunity to share the plan with the voters, given the fact that nobody really knew what the future was gonna bring, there were a lot of uncertainties, given the fact that we were in a presidential election like none other we had seen in our history, we felt that the library and the people who support it deserved an opportunity to understand the picture and to be able to um, 
to be able to be engaged uh, in these types of dialogues to make a conscientious decision moving forward. And then um, in November of this year, whatever the outcome is, we will address that and we will move forward accordingly. But that is why we're bringing this back to the voters right now, um, because we really felt it needed to be it needed to be discussed. We never really got to discuss it, and so it was important to us and to our supporters that we do that. Um, so you can see that it's been a multi-year, very long process to get us to where we are, and with all of the years that we have been engaged in dialogue with the architect for ten plus years now. We just felt like it deserved another dialogue, and that's why we're here this evening. We're not trying to disrespect voters, that's not our intention, but we did think that we needed another dialogue, and so that's why, that's why we're here. Um, so tonight, um, I wanna share with you, not just the background, but I wanna share with you the big picture. I wanna share with you um, some of the issues we're dealing with, and I wanna share with you the solutions that we have to, to remediate those issues. I want you to be able to walk away tonight knowing that when you go to the ballot box, you're making an informed decision. How you vote is your privilege. I respect that, we respect that. We don't presume to tell you how to vote, but we wanna make sure that you have all of the facts to make an informed decision when you go to vote. So I appreciate those of you that decided to come and join us this evening. It really means a lot to me, it means a lot to the board and the staff um, that you're engaged and that you care enough to come and listen. So thank you for that. I'm not gonna go through this whole thing because there's a lot of stuff that you really don't care about and doesn't really pertain to the building. But I just showed you this because, and this is all available on our website too, so you can take a look at this there. Um, but I, I just wanted to lay the groundwork so you understood where we, where we were coming from. Oops. Now, at this point, I'm gonna let Seth Penchensky have the floor and he's going to talk about a lot of numbers and statistical data and things that he says are kind of boring but we need to know it's important that we know um i'll make it brief okay so um the way we begin any project and um i uh libraries have been one of my focuses over my career so i've been involved in probably about construction of about 40 libraries and they're very exciting buildings, very um, important for the communities. And so we do a lot of needs assessment as well um, with every project to see really, it's there's a kind of scientific way to determine how large should a building be. And in public libraries, you basically have standards that are based on the size of the community and the types of goals that the board sets for the collections and the resources that the library houses. And we did that back in 1995 when the library went from 5,000 square feet to this building of about 20, almost 24,000 square feet. Um, and the projection back then was that Oxford was <coughs> gonna basically double the service population in the next 20 years. And we typically use a 20 year window for planning for libraries because usually a bond issue is 20 years. And so you wanna at least make sure that you're planning for 20 years of growth. Um, so pretty much it was very interesting to analyze and look at that the SEMCOG projections were pretty much right on in terms of of growth, the one area where I don't think they were very accurate was the number of young families, because uh, there's been a much greater growth than Semcock had projected in the number of young families. And that has something to do with actually the difference between the adult and youth collections and what was forecast. Um, one of the other reasons that the youth collection is a little, or the youth area is a little smaller was there was a kind of last minute change in the planning of the building that um, swap some areas for staff for staffing reasons that reduce the size of the youth area slightly. And that's one of the reasons that we did that very early renovation to kind of just free up an extra 200 square feet. But um, 
Anyway, so fast forward to a few years ago, or really 2020, when we we're starting this process, um, a needs assessment is what we initially did to see what is the growth projected for the next 20 years. And of course, it's not nearly as grand as it was back in 1995. Um, but the, the other thing that's important is kind of looking at other similar libraries. So we do a comparative analysis to see what the service goals, uh, how they compare for this library versus others. And one of the biggest items that we look at as service goals are the number of items per capita, the number of actual materials in the library, both youth and adult collection teams. And so you can see kind of highlighted in yellow there is Oxford's at four items per capita, which is pretty good. Um, but as you kind of see the comparative libraries, we took other communities of similar size. Um, you know, Orion just south of here is kind of the exception. It's a little larger library and it actually has a under the average of 3.3 items per capita. But you can see the average of there is 4.95. So, Oxford about 20, 25% below um, the average in this particular group of similar libraries. So that kind of said, well, maybe there is some justification for growing um, the collections, not just the youth collection, which we know is kind of undersized, but also the adult collection. The, and then we looked at specifically adult collection versus youth collection and teen collection. And Oxford has a great teen collection, probably one of the best um, in really the state. I mean, it's really up there. And that's because Judy Doublestein, you know, committed to taking that 3,000 square feet that Parks and Rec moved out of right out here and dedicating it to teens. And um, so you see that percentage, 13% there, just blows every other library out of the, the water in terms of collection. And that's really what it, where it should be when you consider that the teen year should represent about 25% uh, of the kind of youth and teen collections. Um, so kudos to Oxford Public Library for her being very, you know, forward thinking in expanding the teen area back in 2005. So that's really not an area that needs to be addressed. But the youth area, you can see the average is 41% and we're at 34. And that's really just because, as Brian will mention later, for every book that goes on the shelf, a new, an old book has got to be discarded. Um, there's just no room at all. The shelves are just totally full. Um, in fact, if people brought all the books that are checked out back in the youth area, they'd have to be stacked on the floor. So you'll also notice in there that the shelving's pretty high for kids, um, higher than we would like to do and higher than we do today. Um, and that was to try and address that lack of space. So you can see here the SEMCOG projections are really not huge in terms of growth, about 2,600 in the next 20 years. Um, and the one thing that we found was that SEMCOG, again, when it came down to children, was actually projecting a reduction in children um, in 20 years. And the board kind of, and Brian kind of said, we don't believe that. <laughs> There's still gonna be a lot, of, a lot more young families moving into the community and of course the current young families get older and some of those kids stay in the community and become 18 to 24 year olds or 25 year olds um but um you know that is definitely with the quality of the schools and what's projected seems like at least the youth collection will remain to grow at the same rate and really needs a a lot to make up. So from all of that, kind of just to not go through all the details, but we create kind of a program of the square footages that are required, what's currently housed in the building and what's required for <clears throat> additional space. And a lot of that has to do, there's some 
<clears throat> you can see some in uh, some staff areas. There are a lot of the programmatic um, requirements are in study rooms and meeting space. And this is what we're seeing a lot of in libraries all across the state is that everybody has demand for more meeting space, more quiet study rooms, small study rooms, board style rooms, um, program rooms. And the interesting thing that I think is gonna come out of this pandemic when everybody has figured out, a lot of businesses have figured out that they can have their employees working from home and they don't need to rent as much office space is it's gonna put even more demand on libraries for that public meeting space because now Okay, we're all going to work from home, but then we need to get together for a meeting. Where are we going to have it? Well, let's use the library. So I think what we're going to see in the next few years when we come out of this pandemic is even more demand for that small public meeting space that we've really seen an increase in with libraries in the last 10 years. And a lot of that has been because people are, there's a lot more small businesses that are operated out of people's homes. They still need places to meet clients, um, and a lot of a lot of people use the library to help run their business. So that's kind of what we're seeing in the future. Um, so there's a little bit of growth in the adult collection um, in this plan. Let's see, that's the end of that slideshow. From here, you wanna go into your, kind of the priorities of the board? Sure. Oops. So we already, in the beginning, we looked at the roadmap, we looked at the historical context, so I'm not gonna go into detail on that. Um, but really, there are five major components to this plan. And the first priority is uh, um, essential, essentially the uh, youth services department. And you can see in this drawing that we, we actually relocate the youth services department from its existing space to the front of the building, we swap actual staff area with off, de or off desk staff area with the youth services department so that we have a better um, topography to expand the facility logically on the footprint of the land that we have to, to grow on. Um, this is just an example of what we anticipate the new space will look like in its expanded format to allow for additional shelving um, as Seth had mentioned uh, in his presentation, one of the, it's not just the capacity of people that we're dealing with, it's the capacity of collections. Um, in this industry, we, we perform a task that's called collection development. And that collection development task encompasses many things. Part of it is selecting new material for the collection. And then when we select new material, we have to be conscientious about having space for that. And we then do what's called weeding. And weeding is when we withdraw material from the collection uh, and it's either sold in the library book sale to raise additional money for the, for the library um, or it's, we use them for summer reading pride. We do a lot of stuff with that book, with those books. But needless to say, the capacity is not just about people, it's about collection. And in our children's department, I'm gonna show you some slides that'll demonstrate that, you'll see that we have an issue with uh, stack capacity and collection capacity. It's more so in the youth department, but we are pretty um, at capacity or near capacity uh, in the adult services department as well. We have issues where we're trying to grow our large, uh, large print collection, and we really have to um, move entire collections in order to make the space to accommodate that. And we do understand that that is becoming more and more a growing need. Uh, but needless to say, the youth services department is the focal point. Um, obviously, there are other parts of the building that need to be adjusted accordingly to make this work, but our focus is in the youth department. We are, uh, I guess, I, I've heard a lot of things in the community lately about the library and how libraries are used and collections are used. I think there's a, a misconception 
of what libraries mean today to different people. They have di the library has a different meaning to any one of you, for that matter, who comes in, whether you come in for a program, whether you come in for educational experience for lifelong learning, whether you come in to use the internet for college or for um, work. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people come to the library today. It's not just about books. We are lifelong learning and everything in between. We're early childhood development. A lot of people don't know this, but libraries in the state of Michigan, all libraries, are classified at the state level under the Department of Education, the Michigan Department of Education. So we take a lot of our directives from the Michigan Department <coughs> of Education. We get our funding, the little bit of state funding that we do get, and it's little, but it's been improving significantly year after year because even our state legislature and our governor understands the important role that we play uh, in early childhood development our state funding has been increasingly getting more and more. Uh, we still have ground to make, but we're appreciative of what we've been able to gain. Um, and so early childhood uh, literacy is a significant piece of the puzzle. Many years ago, we were very fortunate that we received a very sizable contribution to the library, an anonymous contribution to the library. Um, those don't come frequently, but when they do come, we appreciate the fact that they do and we make sure that we fulfill the desires of the contributor um, to the fullest and so what we decided to do with those that particular group of money uh, is our youth services librarian and i took a trip to bloomfield township library because they really have the premier collection for um, not just early literacy but special needs um, we have a lot of parents in this community who have children with special needs and so we wanted to take that money um, that was contributed to us from a donor and we wanted to build our own special needs collection here in Oxford because if you are a parent of special some a child with special needs you know that the tools and resources that you use to help your child are very expensive and so we felt that it was a value to be able to build that collection and make that available to the public and we've been able to do that but again in order to build collections like that that benefit this community we need the space to be able to house those collections and that's one of the struggles that we are dealing with in our children's department this is a elevation um, looking to the south uh, from about where early childhood center or e i'm not even going to begin but the early childhood component of oxford elementary next door to us so this is looking back south at the building um, to the expansion of what will be the future uh, youth services department. We are moving from one area that has the Florence Oberg Garden to an area where we're developing a patio so that we can have story time instead of in the park. We can bring story time in the summer back to the library and have it on the patio. We can also do outdoor programming on that patio. There's a lot of things that can happen there. But we also want to keep it fluid and flexible. This is one of the limitations that I was sharing that I wanted to share with you. Um, this is a picture that was taken not too long ago in our youth services department. And you can see that we're, we're not only using every shelf from top to bottom, all the whole stack is completely packed. And as Seth mentioned, during the pandemic we told you please don't return your material right now. In part because we didn't understand how the pandemic worked, but the other part is we were paranoid because had you returned everything at once, quite honestly, we would not have had the capacity to put it back on the shelves. And we would have had stuff piled in piles in this room and up and down the aisles in the building. So libraries aren't necessarily built to house the entire collections at one time, but during the pandemic, we certainly learned that those times can come and we need to be better prepared for them. Hopefully we never have to go through this again. And hopefully what we're dealing with right now is shortly and we can get to the end of this. That's what we all want. A really well-circulating library is circulating 10% of their collection at any one time. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, when we plan libraries, we figure 10% is going to be checked out. So we don't have to provide the space for that 10%. And one of the things to consider, too, is that the Oxford Public Library is no exception to that rule in that pre-pandemic, we were circulating nearly 270 some thousand items a year. That's a lot, 270 some thousand items a year. And all of the statistics for the last 10 years, you can find on our website, and you can see that gradual climb. 
Now, a lot of folks have been saying, well, I want to see this year's data. Well, I can show you this year's data, but we're not done with this year yet. Or I want to see last year's data. I can show you last year's data, but it's not really a fair assessment of what the Oxford Public Library uh, looks like on a normal pre-pandemic year. Even in this year, we're forecasting to be circulating somewhere near 200 to 240,000 items. That's a lot, given the circumstances we're dealing with. That's a lot. That tells us that people are coming back to the library. It was slow, but they are starting to come back into our doors, and they're starting to look to us for um, many different things that maybe they weren't looking to us look, looking to us in the future or in the past for. So we're trying to accommodate all of those changes uh, and assess the situation to put us in a situation where we can be successful moving forward. Now the next picture is blurry. It's blurred for a purpose because we do have privacy issues in our building. We do believe in upholding patron privacy and we believe in protecting privacy through the Library Privacy Act. Um, we've had some pictures posted on the internet lately that show an empty library and that's not conducive to what the library looks like at any normal busy time. That being said, I'm glad it was an empty library because we're trying not to violate any patron's privacy here. Um, so this, you can get a general idea that the picture shows you our current story hour room and you can see a lot of heads in there, but we have to keep in mind that it's not just the little heads <laughs> that are in that picture. With the little head, you need to have the big head. So um, you can tell that that room is pretty full, even with a blurred out picture. The next picture is after they leave the story hour room, they come out into the children's room proper. And there's a lot of educational resources and toys that our patrons can benefit from, and our parents and children. And ch parents today like their children to be able to play and learn with other children of that age. And the library is a great place to be able to do that. It's a safe place for that. And so we're happy that we have this problem, but we have this problem. And what you're not seeing is behind us is a stack where people are sitting on the floor because there's just nowhere, there aren't enough, there's not enough capacity in that room to have adequate seating for enough adults and the progression of age for the children's department. Priority two is the adult services department. Although it's not as big of a priority as the children's department, it's still a priority because it, the bulk of the expansion to the adult services department is a full line of additional quiet study rooms. Right now we have two quiet study rooms that are available on a first come first serve basis and they are in the adult room. And this uh, expansion will allow us to add additional quiet study rooms and smaller conference rooms because we do have situations like today. We had a small group in here earlier of about eight to 10 people in this room and we also, we, this room has been swapped several times throughout this day, and we have something going on in the room next door. That's a very common occurrence here. And uh, as we try to adjust to that and deal with that, there are situations where those types of meetings would be better suited in a small conference room. And so we're looking at adding some, we're bringing our boardroom back out into the central part of the building to allow uh, for it to be in use to the, by the public when the board or the staff isn't using it. Uh, and we're adding additional quiet study rooms, a local history area for the local history collection. And we're moving the, we're moving the adult computer lab to allow for some minor expansion or modifications to the teen services department so they have better storage capacity in that area. And office space. And office space. So priority three I kind of touched on, but it is really to be able to expand the facility for the additional meeting space um, to, that we see people come to us uh, for today. Um, it's not uncommon for this room or the room next door or the big room to be um, changing multiple times throughout the day. And we do have a building superintendent that takes care of that for us, um, but it is challenging and especially when he goes home at the end of the night and we have several groups in here, it's a lot of work to change everything over. And we do that, um, but it would make life a lot easier if we had the, the proper tools to be able to provide adequate space for those types of meetings. 
Priority four is a makerspace, and a lot of people have said, well, what the heck is a makerspace? And why are you even looking at that? Well, makerspace is really, it's not a new invention, or I, uh, invention's not a bright word there, but it's not a new concept uh, for libraries, but uh, it is one that's becoming more and more popular. And there's a very long explanation of what makerspace is, but the picture, I think, provides the language that you need here. Um, when you look at the top, the top picture, the bottom picture here, and the bottom picture to the right, this is just one example of what a makerspace looks like. If you're curious, it's Novi Public Library. Novi Public Library has a makerspace uh, at their library, Rochester Hills does, Orion does. A lot of libraries in our region do. Um, and it's something that we uh, are looking to add in or incorporate into this, this project. But it's really a movement. It's a movement of people who come together from all backgrounds, all walks of life, all um, age, from young to old, and it brings community together to be able to work on different projects, share fun and exciting ideas and concepts, uh, and, and work on developing enrichment and lifelong learning. It also provides opportunity to resources that people can't necessarily afford um, to purchase on their own. But we, through grants and individual contributions like the one I shared with you earlier, can tool this room to really provide access to endless opportunities for our community. It also provides a flexible craft space for our cooking programs or for our craft program, uh, for just a whole number of things that we can utilize the space for, for robotics, for computer club. A lot of things that we do to support our directive under the Michigan Department of Education uh, and bring our community together through lifelong learning can be done in this space. And when it all comes together in a harmonious way, we get pictures like this one in the upper right hand corner where we have people coming together um, in ways we never expected. And the truth of the matter is, as we've talked to others who have these maker spaces and have, pushed, have implemented them into their libraries, that what we anticipate to be will be once we have it that the community will come together and will start using this space uh, in ways that they never imagined. The fifth priority is the not so fun stuff, the heating and cooling for the building. Um, the infrastructure, the heating and cooling infrastructure for this building is uh, 24 years old. Yeah, about 24 years old. And um, some of the components have been updated um, a little bit to try to make them um, have a longer uh, way of life. Um, and others are just, have said we've had enough and it's time that you replace us. So I'm here to say tonight that regardless of the outcome of the bond, if the bond is successful, we will be incorporating an overhaul to the HVAC system into that bond. But if the bond is not successful, we have planned for an overhaul to the HVAC system. We have budgeted for that and we have money in reserves to be able to handle that. Now, um, I have heard folks say, well, why didn't you address that outside of this? It really doesn't make sense to address that if you're looking at a bond, but obviously we will make changes. And the money, regardless that we have in our reserve fund, will, if it, isn't used on the HVAC infrastructure, there are other components to this project that we will use that money uh, toward, like an expansion to the parking lot um, and some other upgrades that we need to be making to this building. So there are things, and, and plus we need to take into consideration that we have, for our fund balance, we have a budget for that balance. And everything is allocated out, and I can show that to you uh, this evening so you can see. But we're thinking about and planning for not just replacing an HVAC infrastructure, but also the replacement of the roof. I mean, we have a multifaceted roof on this building or multi-component uh, of a combination of metal to asphalt shingles to a rubber membrane. And that rubber membrane is um, it's doing quite well. We do have leaks occasionally. We address those when they happen. It's inevitable. But one day that's going to have to be replaced. And Am I off base by saying probably about a hundred and a quarter? Uh, I don't recall, but I think that's close. 
Yeah. yeah, well, I talked to our roofing company, so I kind of had an idea of what that's going to cost. And it's mind boggling um, that something like a roof can cost about $125,000. It's mind boggling when you think that to replace the entire HVAC infrastructure, which also includes boilers in this building, a combination of rooftop units, boilers, air handlers, and um, automated controls is around $700,000. And a lot of folks, when I say that, they either say, you're wrong, or they say, whoa, I can't believe that. Um, but that's what it is. That's what these units cost. That's what this infrastructure requires. It's not home. I mean, when I replace a furnace at home, it might be, you know, five or six thousand dollars, maybe seven thousand dollars, or an air conditioning unit, three or four thousand dollars. So it's hard to compare that with home, but it's not the same. We're not comparing apples with apples there. <clears throat> And then the big picture kind of shows you the layout of what it's going to be. And I'm not going to keep this up long because we're going to show you a walkthrough of the building. The proposal itself is a $9.1 million bond for 20 years. And I've seen a lot of stuff on social media lately that just is unbelievable. But at the end of the day, what I want you to know is that it is a $9.1 million bond to calculate your portion of this for 20 years would be to take the taxable value box on your Oxford Township tax bill, multiply it by the multiplier. The first year it is 0.55, estimated to be about 0.55. It's reduced to about 0.48 every year thereafter. So you multiply the amount of your taxable value, not what you would sell your house for, but your taxable value multiplied by the multiplier over the average years about 0.48 um, and then divide that by a thousand. That'll give you a rough idea of what your portion will be. Now those of you that are from Oxford know that Oxford has homes on both ends of the spectrum and everything in between. We're very unique in that respect and that's what makes Oxford a very interesting place to be. But that being said, the average household the average household in this community will be paying somewhere between about $55 on the low end to about maybe $80, $85 on the high end. Um, and then of course there are people outside of that window, but that really is the average window for this community. And that is per year. So there are a lot of things that have been calculated and shared on the web. Um, they calculate the entire payoff of the bond not what the yearly amount is. And I just want you to know that that's the truth. Those are the facts. The numbers don't lie. Actually, I want you to go back to the plan just to give people a little bit of an overview here. This plan? Yeah. So the three year major components that Ryan mentioned, the youth area, you can see to the upper right, uh, it's about probably the, the largest piece of the expansion. Um, and then the adult edition to the left there, you can see multiple quiet study rooms, computer lab, local history room, um, and a little bit of expansion of collection for large print, AV materials, et cetera, some study tables as well. Um, and then there's a little bit of additional space in for the staff um, kind of really more storage and uh, friend sorting area, et cetera. Um, and then a very small expansion of this room to just create a little more capacity for this room. Um, so that's kind of the square footage. Now every bit of the building will be addressed because the mechanical system um, goes through how things, cosmetic things like paint and a lot of the carpet has been replaced recently. Um, lighting, even though lighting has been, uh, like fluorescent lamps have been replaced with LED lamps, even those LED lamps have a life and the ballast um, or drivers for the LED lamps have a life. So some of those will be replaced as well as part of the project. So there's a lot of infrastructure to the whole building that's addressed in the project. 
you want to go into the video? Sure, but before we do, just uh, so you can get the lay of the land, um, this is the children's room as it is right now. This space here, including this little space here and here, that's the existing children's room. And they're proposing to swap this space here that is off desk area with the children's area and then expand it into this area here to make the new children's area. And then the off desk space here for staff for processing will move to this space here. And that will interconnect all of our staff areas for safety and security reasons. And it also allows us to move our boardroom from this back corner out to the middle of the building to be accessible to the public and available to the public when it's not in use by us. One of the other kind of important um, reasons behind the addition, not just the other thing that's kind of not shown here, is the site plan. And we plan when we built the building to actually for the building to be expanded. Um, and, and these are exactly the areas that we had planned for them to expand. Um, and it was one of the reasons that the youth area was supposed to go <laughs> in that area to begin with. But the, um, what's nice about how this plan is working out is that one of the things we don't want to do during the expansion is to shut down the library. We need to keep the library open. And so by doing it in this fashion, it allows us to kind of build the new youth area and then literally almost overnight move the youth collection to the new youth area move the staff into the old youth area without really missing a beat and shutting down the library. The adult edition is similarly easy because that's really expansion of new space and the collection won't infringe on the collection. So you know, the biggest problem is going to be the mechanical system and phasing that. So that's all part of the kind of thinking behind how this project would actually get carried out. So one of the things we haven't really talked about is at the entrance of the building, there's a courtyard. Everybody's walked through. And um, one of the things we'd like to do is to make that courtyard more used, have more paving, more seating out there, um, and more shelter so that we're, one of the proposals is to add a kind of canopy as you enter that um, would be made out of kind of a fiberglass panel system that allows light to come through, but shelter. So that's what you'll first see as we walk. Well, actually, I guess that'll be later when we go all the way around. First, we're going to tour around the outside. This is the new adult wing of the building. Oh, this is youth. I'm oh, sorry, youth. <laughs> Dyslexia kicking in. Um, <laughs> And Ryan had mentioned this outdoor courtyard. There will actually be, as well, a four-foot high fence around it for security reasons, but we're just not showing that for clarity. We're kind of skipping over a little staff edition. Then this is the adult edition with these quiet study rooms around the perimeter. And this is all looking into the woods, so it's mostly glass for views. And then the computer lab is in this corner, and the local history room has the small windows. And there's an archive as well for local history materials. This is just a small expansion here, out for this room. And then as we walk in, that's that covered canopy that I was mentioning, and more paved area here for outdoor seating. So then as we walk into the building, um, you'll see the fish tank hasn't moved. Um, right in front, but we are relocating the welcome desk from its current location to that new location. The existing checkout remains here, but now you see there's this new entry into the youth area. And, um, and I, I just, sorry to interrupt, but I want to make it clear too that we're using the existing furniture in the new location. We're not purchasing new desks. We're taking the support services desk or the welcome desk that you see now, and we're moving it to another portion of the library so we won't be purchasing new desks. Yeah, these desks have been actually, all right, I'm gonna jump in here. So here's the maker space, which is the first um, thing, kind of in this transition space before you're truly into the youth area so that it can be used by adults without disrupting the youth area. It can easily be used by the youth for crafting. Or so teen. Or teen, very multi-purpose. 
Um, then as you go into the youth area, the existing story hour room, which is a very nice space, but it's a little small, uh, is expanded a little bit to give it about 20% more capacity. And better storage. And additional storage, yeah. And then here you see the expansion of the youth area, kind of a raised ceiling similar to the adult area to kind of bring some natural light in. Keep that same motif going. More um, floor space for children to play and learn together and for parents and more appropriate seating for parents and children of all ages. Yeah. So, because right now, I just want to point something out. Um, right now, keep this in mind, um, you know, when children are being tutored in our building, and it happens almost on a daily basis during the school year, um, they're being tutored right out on the floor, right out at a table in the middle of everywhere. And think about the humiliation for a young or older elementary school student, or maybe even a young junior high student who is being tutored, and then their friends walk in the building. These quiet study rooms and these areas of the building that we're looking at adding on to provide uh, a place for those tutors and students to, first of all, be in a more private area, but two, uh, have the ability to be able to interact with each other without people walking by them constantly. Buzzers going off at the front desk and um, the, the noise that we have in a, in a busy library. Patio space and looking back into this is the preschool kind of space on the right and the grade school collection on the left with a slightly higher shelving but you can see all that shelving is lower than the existing shelving there will be a few kind of little bump outs on the front of the building for some seating As we go back out into the lobby space, there's some additional seating built in here, almost more like a cafe type of seating. Um, it's kind of a kind of can. It's a fluid space in yeah. that, like, for example, the um, the Lucky Day collection might go there. The periodical collection could go there. The audiovisual collection is being moved into each department in this plan with exception of perhaps the CD music collection may stay in this area. That hasn't been clearly defined yet, but those are logistical things that we can work through as we work through moving back into the space. But that is the preliminary plan that we have for this. And as Seth mentioned, the welcome desk, the main circulation desk, is now being relocated into the middle central part of the atrium foyer. idea of that cafe kind of space being placed you can wait for somebody meet people it's a little more casual than more study space there's a business center here to the left with copier and existing mill work and then the boardroom as Brian mentioned is relocated to the center of the building here so that it's really can be multi-purpose it can be accessed by a lot of different groups. Doors are added to the adult area here just to be able to close it off from acoustical reasons at certain times when the library is very busy. And then here you're walking into the expansion of the adult area, some low shelving, lots of tables for studying, these quiet study rooms and two restrooms as well. Computer lab. And then we're going to walk back out into the existing adult space where actually some additional seating will be located and then into the local history and genealogy room with some displays, um, a lot of visibility in and out, and an archive room. And as we walk kind of back past the current teen area, back to this meeting room, uh, we'll see just a glimpse of the ex 
expansion of the meeting room. It's more pushing the walls out a little more to allow for the stacks to be better aligned and we can get more stacks in there for additional um, growth to the collection. And office space. For and office and storage room. space as well. Yeah. And that wall. So this room looks a lot bigger without that wall uh, <laughs> closed. but. Uh, Lowering the window so you know you can have more visibility out um, to the park, um, and then you see kind of almost uh, expansion of this end of the building to really get a few more rows of seating when there's really large uh, vents. So that is kind of the walkthrough I have um, with me, so that. 3D model that we create to kind of create that video I actually have and I brought some virtual reality goggles and if uh, people are interested I can um, take the time to set that up and uh, people can walk through the building um, themselves. But let's uh, answer any questions first that, about the plan that we've presented here. Yes. You made the importance of having the uh, over shelter in the front so that people can sit out there, but I didn't see anything like that in that children's area to go outside. Right. Um, perhaps that would be something to have some kind of a cover over it so that it can be used if it is raining or yeah. what, you know, keep a little bit more, or sunny. Yeah, we do have kind of, of that. Uh, in that plan, there was kind of like a pergola almost, like some okay. wood structure. So one of the things we looked at is Kind of having a almost like a, what they call a tensile structure where okay. you can have some canvas that actually drapes between them and you can open them and close them good idea yeah, yeah. Right. some sun shelter sometimes right. exactly. is, is I important think that's as a rain important shelter thing today yeah. right yeah absolutely the main entryway the hardscape over the main entryway is primarily because it's the in you know the entrance um, to the building and a lot of people are dropped off at the yes. front entryway and on a rainy day or a snowy day it mm -hmm. provides some shelter to come into the building. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that observation. You're welcome. Any other questions? Are people interested in the 3D walkthrough experience? <laughs> yeah, or that or I can push on a roller coaster. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> are, you, are you taking questions about the physical building right now or do you want questions overall? You, you can, this is question and answer, so we can take questions. Sure. Okay, so uh, you had mentioned um, that the that we had voted on this once before. Correct. Uh, social media is a monster, and I'm one of the worst offenders, and I apologize for that. But I would just say uh, it's been said that it's been it was voted on three different times, and I'm I, I'd love to hear your explanation. I, I I realize that's not true, and I'm curious. Absolutely, um, the Oxford Public Library operates on an operational millage um, that. Uh, operates in perpetuity meaning it doesn't expire but it does get rolled back year after year by the Headley amendment um, and so I, I don't quote me on this but I think the last time we have two different perpetual millages one um, was passed before this building was built and one was passed right around the same time that this building was built um, to allow for the increased operational expense that this building would carry. Um, so there are two of those. Several years ago, we did go to the voters to request, and I, and I don't know how many years ago that was, but I'm gonna say it was probably five to six years ago, maybe somewhere in that ballpark. We did go to the voters to ask for what is called a Headley override. That is not to build a building. That's not anything to do with this project. That is to restore the original millage back to its original levy, and then we start over. So it takes the loss that we gained as it's been rolled back and rolled back and rolled back, because the original levy, operational levy, was like 1.85 mills combined for the two uh, levies for the operating. Uh, and it's over years has been rolled back to like 1.3 something, I wanna say today. And so what we were looking to do is restore that back to the 1.85 and start over with the Hadley override. Um, we attempted to do that on two separate occasions. They were both turned down by the voters. 
So this project, however, was brought to the voters a year ago for the first time. Um, so what you're hearing in social reading and social media is very misleading um, because it's not the truth. It's just not the truth. One is operating, one is bond. This proposal has been brought to the voters once. To have the override is a separate issue. So if you take the big picture, now that we've brought that to the table, the library has not asked for an increase from the voters in over 20 years. In fact, close to 25 years is the last time the library has gotten any funding um, approved by any voter in this community. We have operated on the same revenue or same uh, uh, millage for that period of time being rolled back year after year after year. The only saving grace is during good times, the property values go up a little bit. During bad times, they try to balance that. Um, but we have not received any additional funding other than our original 20-some-year-old funding uh, in 20-some years. Um, so I think, personally, the fact that we've been able to do what we've been able to do without any additional funding in nearly 25 years I'm biased, of course, because I'm the library director, but it says a lot for my predecessor as well. They were very forward in their thinking process. They put into place mechanisms that made the library stable and sustainable. Those of you that know me know that I'm a librarian, but I grew up in business. My whole family are business owners. And so I may be a librarian by day, but the way I think is but as a business person, because that's the household I grew up in. And so I apply very practical day-to-day -day business solutions to the way that we budget and forecast and save for these types of projects. Um, and I think that in many ways, although I've taken a lot of heat for that recently, I don't apologize. I think that I've made the right decisions and the board feels that we've made the right decisions to put us in a place where we are sustainable and we can continue to do the great things that we do in this community. So I'm sorry, but that's where I say I don't apologize for that. Um, and, and so we're successful. Um, and it, that's a great answer. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. I think one thing I would add is a bystander doesn't live in Oxford, <laughs> but um, about what 6,400 people came out to vote during a pandemic last year in August um, for a, pro a pro proposal that was not marketed um, and it failed by 47 Seven. votes. Yeah. So you know it's a that's a 50-50 split of the community, and so I I totally understand why the the board would want to you know for the sake of the people who did vote for it want to bring it back um, to get a better representation of the community. Yes? Um, since we're talking about money, um, I know that there's been a lot also in the newspaper, on social media, everywhere about the fact that you carry a $1.5 million balance. Um, I'm sure that part of that is helped by that helps us get through the reduction in operating budget. But is that on a line for other uh, municipal, you know, the fire department, the township, whatever? Uh, where are we in terms of how much of a reserve is a public entity key? Well, I, I appreciate that question as well. And I can share with you that the township's um, audit is available for anyone to look at on the township's website. And we are a Public Act 164 township library, meaning that we are, by definition, part of the township, but we are autonomous in that we're not a direct department of the township. We work independently. We have our own governing elected board. And we, we have our own independent audit conducted every year, outside of the township's audit, but by definition, we are included in the township's audit as well. So, if you want to take a look at the fund balances for the entire township, you can do that on your own, pulling that audit off of the township's website, and you can see where we stand in comparison to the general fund, in comparison to um, parks and recreation, in comparison to the fire department, in comparison to police. We're all on there. 
And I would encourage you to do that because it's an eye opener. When you look at that, you're going to see very quickly that we are not out of line. Yeah. The uh, kind of the the element, the biggest part of that is you know when you start adding up, um, you know if bond doesn't pass. The library still has to replace the mechanical system, replace the roof at some point, um, redo the parking lot at some point. So you start adding those things up and you've got about a million dollars right there, maybe more. <laughs> and then um, you really need to have about, you know, rule of thumb is having about a third of your annual budget in reserve just for operations. Um, so that's kind of how that all would basically add up. So, yes, sir. So, two other kind of hot button issues. I, I'm just curious, maybe Seth can address this. Sure. Uh, the floor plan of the building, um, it's been said there was no uh, easement allowed from the school or from Parks and Rec or, yeah, or good other question. places. Yeah, we've heard that um, so, a I'm number curious, of times. And then the other the flip side of that question is, um, do you have your zoning set? Have you already talked to the planning board, planning commission, and all that? Where do you stand on that? That's a multi. And then I'll shut up. I'm done with yeah, my let, me, let me address so, that. So I'm going to address the first one first because um, we we actually had a slightly different plan here. Let's see how's this. Uh, there's a laser here, right? There is. It's the top um, button. That one right there. Got it. So. Um, we actually had a slightly different configuration of the youth expansion here, and we met with the township planner and the township supervisor for a preliminary meeting. And uh, you know, one of the things that came up in that conversation was questioning whether this access to the receiving area, staff parking area, was whether there was an easement. And I had to really rack my brain back to 1995 to remember whether there was an easement or not. But we did some research and found out there was just a, a, basically an agreement, not a true legal easement. And so Ryan did address that with the, the um, superintendent and um, of the schools. And the board was not interested in providing a legal easement, but was fine to continue the current um, agreement to access using their property for vehicular access. Um, but one of the things we then changed was to make sure that if at some point, let's say the school sold that property and somebody removed that agreement, um, that we could have enough room to put through a driveway for access. So that's basically what would come right through here. We would lose the patio for the youth area at some point in the future if that ever came to be. Um, but that was one of the questions that came on. So, um, so we pulled the building back away from the setback, the property setback, yeah. um, and we pushed it more to the west, wrapping around that central courtyard to allow for a future service drive that we may or may not have to put in, but we have the property to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and actually, I wanna say that that actually turned um, lemons into lemonade for us because the building expansion was more narrow before um, going out to the property setback. And when we revisited the plan based on what we learned from the planner and the township supervisor, um, Seth and his team pushed, staggered and pushed the building back on the property accordingly and it really, it, it, the same footprint, or same amount of square footage, maybe even less five, right? right? Five bit. square feet or so. But it feels much more open and airy, and it's actually better usable space. So it ended up to be in our favor. So I'm not complaining about that at all. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, the downside to that move was it cost a little more because of relocating some of the service payment. Um, so it was a little more, we were trying to keep the the addition as efficient as possible from a cost standpoint, um, but not a big deal in the whole scope of things. Um, the other area that's kind of interesting, so what you're seeing here is the property line is the outer boundary, right down the center of the boulevard. This is a shared boulevard that was built uh, with Parks and Rec at the time. The library paid for it. Um, we maintain it as well. And maintain 
means it, right? And then the center, second line is the setback from the property lines. And actually, when the building was built, there was half, the side setback was half the size. And you can kind of see the corners of this existing meeting room right there. If you stand right there, you're over the setback. <laughs> um, sticks about two feet over the setback line. That makes the building actually a non-conforming building. So you might also hear that in, you know, you're trying to expand a non-conforming building, or, or the building is non-conforming. Well, yes, the building is now non-conforming because the zoning ordinance changed in the last 20 years. But um, this addition, small addition to the meeting room is not intrud intruding on that setback. So that was fine with the planner. Um, the other thing that um, was something we had to address, which may have over a little bit, was our first approach was to, we need additional parking for the additional space. There's gonna be more people coming to the library. So the hope was to use the parks parking here, improve it, make it larger, pave it, and have a shared parking. Um, the park, Parks and Rec was not interested in doing that, so we're expanding the parking lot on the library's property here. And I know that there's some, I'm gonna address social media too because I read it. Um, I don't respond to it, but I read it. And there's discussion on social media that we need to expand the parking lot to the east, I think. Well, there's a thing in the paper today, I think, that says we need to per acquire property to the east in order to do this. Well, newsflash, we own all the property out to Pontiac Street. We don't have to acquire any property to do this. Um, and everything is within the setbacks. And to answer the question about zoning and planning, and I'm sorry if I'm stepping on your toes, but we will absolutely, absolutely, absolutely go to zoning and planning in due course. It is not common practice, contrary to what some people believe, it is not common practice to go to zoning and planning for municipal projects before it's approved to the voter. It's actually an exception when communities do that. And so, although people have an opinion, it's not a fact. And we know that it's not a fact. And we're doing our best to make sure that you understand that it's a lie. <laughs> so I, you know, in the, my, history of doing probably 40 different library projects, you know, we often will go obviously meet with the planner and make sure that we're on the right track, but, you know, going through the site plan approval process can be, you know, a $50,000, you know, adventure because you've got to get all your engineering in place, you've got to get surveys, um, and that, that can be quite an expense that, you know, is kind of silly to, to spend before the, the the people have approved the project to even be pursued. So, um, isn't part of the project. You know, we thought that we were doing the right thing by meeting with the planner um, ahead of time, and I think that was very beneficial. Um, so that's pretty much it. The um, you know what we're seeing here is there is quite a drainage depression, which was actually a natural depression um, when we built the building um, that drains all the stormwater for the building and the parking lot. And um, so that's the one thing about expanding the parking lot to the east is that that'll be retained. There'll be a lot of cost in the retaining of that parking so that, you know, it'll basically, you'll fall right off into about a 10 foot, you know, drainage area. Um, and that drainage basin is so large that it's adequate for the whole site. Uh, even expanding the parking and the building. So that's the good news, is that we don't have to deal with stormwater, which can be a very big expense. But that, you know, this expanded parking is going to be a little bit more expensive, definitely, than, you know, than improving the parking for parks and rec. But the bottom line will be there will be then a lot more parking between the two parking lots for both you know, the park and the library. I mean, I was amazed how many, park, you know, how many people were parking out here this evening. So, but I remember there were days, um, you know, where this room would be full and people would be parking all the way out the boulevard, you know. Well, on election day, we tend to have people parking on Parks and Rec property and all up and down the boulevard. But um, do we have any other questions? Oh, here we go. 
I asked it so many years. No, no, no. Thanks for answering those questions up there. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. I, I don't. It's not really a question, but it's um, more of an observation. And as an Oxford Township resident, I'll have to say um, I'm thrilled that the obstacle that you encountered between Parks and Rec and the township and the school, I'm, I'm glad it worked out for the design. But as an Oxford Township resident, I am very, very disappointed in the lack of cooperation and teamwork that you have from your own team. You might all be separate entities, but we're Oxford Township and it's a team. And, excuse me, I, and so I'm very passionate about this. I'm very disappointed in the lack of cooperation and understanding between those groups. So I just wanted to say that thank you for the great job that you've done, and, and uh, I have enjoyed this presentation very much tonight, and you answered a lot of questions, but, and, and I will be following up with that. I am very disappointed in, in their behavior and this whole thing. So well, I, I appreciate that. I'm not here, keep in mind, I'm not here to throw anyone under the bus. I can appreciate the fact that the school decided not to give us a permanent easement. I understand that, and I respect that. And we can certainly work around that and, and make this happen without that. That's it's that's a moot point to me. Um, as a, you know, as someone that's concerned, if you choose to take that up as your prerogative, but I'm not here to say that um, I I'm disappointed. But I totally understand where they're coming from, and I can I can respect that. Um, likewise with Parks and Rec, um, I'm disappointed, but I totally understand where they're coming from in that it is. A DNR piece of property and it does complicate matters and so um, to, to say that it would be easy to make it happen is a stretch um, could it happen absolutely both of the things could have happened but I'm not here I'm here being neutral and saying that I, I have no objection to what they did I wish we could have worked it out it would have certainly made it easier but it certainly doesn't mean just because those two things didn't happen that this project can't happen on its existing envelope and that's the important thing to understand here I don't care what Parks and Rec does I mean I care but I don't care about that I don't care about the school issue the important thing is understanding that what we're proposing fits within zoning on this envelope and we're gonna make it happen here and and that's just what it ended up being and, and that's fine that's perfectly fine. I'm okay with that. Well, good. You I'm glad question. to hear that, and I'm glad that you managed it that way. Thank you. Um, some of my questions I had coming in have already been answered, and the gentleman on the right, and other questions here. But when you guys talk about things that are going on in social media, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Very good. Keep it that way. Yeah, keep Absolutely. Yes. I see billboards. Yes. I see flyers, and and I see articles. Oh. And I look at them and I go. You know where does this information come from how, how are these statements validated and like you said earlier brian you know you're not here to convince anybody how to vote and and i don't feel that way either how the public feels the vote that's fine but I, w I want the true story out there for the public to make their decisions and when i see these kind of things and when i look at some of it i know you know uns unsubstantiated comments you know like who are these people and i'm just curious I hear the social media side, but you know, like I said, I see billboards, pieces of paper, newspaper articles. How are you going to try to address that so that the true story is out there so people can vote their conscious? Well, I, I will just share with you that um, I, I'm going to be upfront and honest with everybody. And if I don't think a plan can happen, I'm going to let you know that I don't think it's going to happen. Um, but this plan is something that has been discussed off and on for a long time and everything that Seth has presented um, in preliminarily is well within the scope of what we can accomplish here and as far as the social media goes I don't get involved in it I have people telling me who are involved in it what's happening out there but I stay out of it because I don't really want to know everything that's going on out there um, like you I might be a librarian, but I don't do social media, and I don't do it for a reason. And uh, But I do have a team of people that keep me well informed on what's happening. And that's the way I prefer to stay. 
Um, and, you know, I just want more than anything people to understand the facts. And I appreciate you coming to, to, under, to understand, to hear from us um, what we're trying to accomplish here. Uh, I had someone call me this afternoon that said they got that flyer that you're talking about right there in the mailbox. And if they didn't think any better to call me, they would likely vote in opposition to it. Um, but after we had a long dialogue, I, you know, maybe I changed that person's mind. I don't know. Um, that's their business, and it remains their business, and that's how I fly. But um, I just want people, as a librarian, as your head information professional in this community, I'm the director of the library, but I am the municipal librarian, and I am the information head here. And I'm telling you, from an information professional's point of view, there's a lot of fake news going on out, right, out there right now. And so I appreciate the fact that you took the point to come here and to learn what is the truth. And thank you so much for doing that. Yes? Brian, do you have a plan to say a, a larger newspaper article that I think what he's attributing to like, you know, I know there are different folks that are writing uh, letters to the air editor in um, favor, you know, vote yes, and, and a lot of that, and they have their own set of facts that they come out with. Does the library plan on having any kind of a, like a bullet point miniature or presentation in the paper prior to the, the voting that maybe folks could get that, that says it's coming from the library, not vote yes, vote no, right. but here's the bullet you know, bullet Facts. points of this plan. Right. Yeah, what, what we need to understand is, um, as a municipality, as a unit of government, we don't advocate for or against. We make the project happen if you choose to put us in that position to do that. Um, and, and so, um, I will share the facts. Every time I'm asked about the facts, I will share the facts. Um, I, I, again, I don't get into the political side of that. I leave that to the campaigns. And I stay out. And you know what, my life is better because of it. And, um, but I will make sure that anybody that wants to know the truth, I will share the truth. And, uh, and you know, if you know people that are asking questions about it, encourage them to call me or come in and see me and I'll sit down with them anytime. But, let's, let's, but that's a small amount of people. I, and, I, and what, we're sa what he's saying is that this is a, a mass production. The billboard is out there every day. These yellow flyers are going into mailboxes. Do you have a group besides your there, there that, is, that are going to be counteracting? There are campaigns on both sides. Okay. Um, and they're they're duking it out, okay. but it's not my job to. Duke well, and it I out. know that I understand that, but I, I just feel that right. something has to counteract these to get the information out because the common person, I mean. Township, or Oxford Township is a lot bigger than this. I understand that. I, I, I totally expected get a whole that. lot more people here tonight. I, I know. And you know, the, the newspaper, I would be more than happy to sit down with them any day, any time, um, and do, uh, do an interview with them. I've already sat down with OCTV. Okay. Um, it's about a 30 minute long presentation okay. um, going into some of the stuff that we talked about tonight. Mm -hmm. But it's all factual okay. um, information about you know the budgets and, and right. the the plan itself um, so I have done some of that the stuff I'm legally able to, able to do sure uh, and then I let the campaigns take okay. care of the rest that's all I can do gotcha. and, I, and then I have to just say you know let the chips fall where they may mm -hmm. <laughs> but we need um, we need to know that there are two different stories out there and one is misleading at best and um, one is the facts just to follow up on this lady's comment about you know a summary of the facts for the Oxford leader and why this burns me so much I don't know why mm -hmm. but why wouldn't that be considered let me put it like that not not a political statement but yes well no here's a clear summary on the plan that might address some of these issues, like we have the land, for example. You know, right. Um, we have and budgets to run the place because we have, you know, things that we have to fix just right. to keep the, the right. place. 
why can't put in there, why would there be an opposition to putting just a straight up summary like that? No political tone, no yes or no. This is the facts behind what's going on with the proposed expansion. Well, and, and we have, um, not to put him on the spot, but we do have the uh, reporter from the Oxford Leader here this evening. Um, and, and Where is so, he? And so, um, the information, the inf and we have OCTV with us this evening too. So the information from this uh, presentation, I'm sure, will be, um, they'll do their due diligence and they'll make sure that what we're sharing is accurate. Um, and all of the data to support it is on our website. Uh, and if it's not on our website, I can gladly share that data. Um, so we're going through that process. Um, did we anticipate we would be, we would hit the level of resistance we did? No, but that's just the way it works. And um, I, as hard as it is not to take it personal, I can't take it personal. And it's hard. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, how, how do you access, uh, you know, I, don't, I have not, uh, let's say, viewed Oxford uh, Community TV. How do you do that? I'm not really you can sure. do it through the web. Okay. Um, you, can, you can Google um, Oxford Community Television, because I don't know their exact web address, but you can okay. Google Oxford Community Television and go to their website, and they have a YouTube channel um, that has all of their films and their meetings and all that on there. You can watch those. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I do believe uh, the <coughs> actual informational meeting that I sat down with OCTV on um, a week or so ago is on our Facebook page. But again, I don't know how Facebook works and where that is in the logistics yeah. of things these yeah. days. But you can view it on YouTube by going to the Oxford Community Television okay. um, so website. Is that correct? Search. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Go to YouTube and search it, it'll come up too. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm assuming this meeting will be there somewhere along the line. Um, I, I assume OCTV is here. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. I think we have one other presentation in a couple weeks from now weeks. on a Thursday in the morning hour, like around ten thirty. Um, we'll be having another one. I know there was some confusion because we did throw a virtual meeting in the mix last night. I apologize for the confusion. I'll take responsibility for that. But it was a last minute thing to try to provide another avenue for people who maybe couldn't make it tonight or are still uncomfortable not coming out into crowds. So thank you very much. Again, if you have any follow-up questions, you know where to find me. I'm here. And, um, and, and if you are interested, um, take a peek at the building through the virtual reality lens. It's much different. So thank you so much, folks. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.